Hello, and welcome to this Ask the Experts session. My name is Dr. Matthew Hamilton. You recently participated in a program that was titled Putting a Spotlight on Systemic Mesocytosis, a multidisciplinary look at early diagnosis and management, where you and learners had the opportunity at that time to dot down any questions you had about systemic mesocytosis. This is now the time we can go and answer some of those questions. So the first question, should we consider the KIT D816V mutation, the most common mutation that's in systemic mesocytosis, should we consider getting this mutation in patients with severe anaphylaxis in the presence of normal serum tryptase? Very important question. So I think when you have a patient who has anaphylaxis, especially unexplained anaphylaxis, I think it's very important to get that baseline serum tryptase level. So we're talking about getting that tryptase level outside of the anaphylaxis window, so the baseline level. If that level is above 11.4, you should really be thinking about systemic mesocytosis. But recent studies have actually shown that if you have a baseline serum tryptase even less than 11.4 in someone that has unexplained anaphylaxis, you could consider getting the KIT D816V mutation that would suggest systemic mesocytosis. Studies have shown that in these patients, these anaphylaxis patients, that have a normal baseline serum tryptase, let's say 11, below 11.4, about 5% of them will actually have the D816V mutation. And then you can do your further workup for systemic mesocytosis at that point. So I think the answer to this question is yes. If you have a patient, unexplained anaphylaxis, and maybe even has a normal baseline serum tryptase, you should really consider getting that KIT D816V mutation. Do you see patients with isolated disease of the GI tract without serum markers of mast cell disease? Another interesting question, uh, this, this has come up actually in recent studies, and I think a lot of this is, is coming up because we're biopsying a lot of people with symptoms, a lot of GI biopsies, so colon biopsies, intestinal biopsies, at the time of endoscopy and colonoscopy. Occasionally, a pathologist will actually identify clonal mast cells suggestive of mastocytosis and even aggregate cells suggestive of systemic mastocytosis. The question is, what do you do with that patient now where you've identified those clonal mast cells suggestive of mastocytosis. If you don't have any other clinical features of mastocytosis, if the tryptase is normal, no symptoms, you may argue you don't really do anything other than monitor the patient for symptoms and progression of symptoms. If they do have other suggestive features, if the baseline serum tryptase, let's say, is above 11.4, maybe you check the D816V mutation if that's positive, then a patient like this really should be getting a, a bone marrow to look for evidence of systemic mesocytosis. Does the severity of symptoms parallel the severity of the disease in mesocytosis? Good question, and really the answer to this is not necessarily. Patients with indolent disease, their symptoms oftentimes are the mast cell mediator type driven symptoms, rather than the patients with more aggressive disease that have symptoms you know, related to their end organ dysfunction. So, it actually turns out that the, the mediator-related symptoms can actually be more severe than the end organ symptoms. So you can have a patient with pretty mild indolent mastocytosis as, in terms of severity of disease, but their symptoms are actually quite significant. So again, the, the severity of symptoms does not always parallel the severity of disease in mastocytosis. So the next question, are there any GI-specific treatments to consider for patients with mastocytosis? Typically, the, the symptoms that, uh, you know, the common GI symptoms that you see in patients with mast cell cytosis tend to respond really well to the anti-mast cell, anti-mast cell mediator type treatments. Things like antihistamines, oral chromalin will, will really be uh, really helpful for these patients for GI symptoms. But more specifically, if your patients have peptic type symptoms, so heartburn, reflux, pain in the you know, upper abdomen area, Remember, a lot of these patients with mesocytosis are at higher risk for peptic ulcer disease, and this is due to the, the histamine effect on acid production. So treating peptic ulcer disease or presumed peptic ulcer disease or looking for peptic ulcer disease and treating with something like a proton pump inhibitor antacid can be very helpful to treat the symptoms, uh, especially the heartburn peptic type symptoms that these patients may have. Another GI-specific treatment could be in, in patients with more aggressive disease that have like a significant burden of the clonal mast cells in the GI tract and actually have evidence of malabsorption. You could actually treat these patients with steroids and we actually use budesonide uh, as a little bit of a safer type of steroid with less systemic effect that can be very helpful 
to get the burden of mast cells down in the intestine and to relieve the malabsorptive type symptoms that patients with aggressive mast cell cytosis may have. How important is it to diagnose HET, hereditary alpha tryptasemia, and how do you specifically test for it? So this, this is really a question that's come up just in the last couple of years, and I think we, we maybe have the answer to this just in the last year. So this is a new finding. So as you know, patients with hereditary alpha tryptasemia, they have elevated levels of baseline serum tryptase, so typically above eight. Um, and this is due to the increased tryptase copy number of their gene, TPSAB1 gene. Um, and so we also know now from studies, that, again, just done in the last year, that about 18% of patients with mastocytosis actually have hereditary alpha tryptasemia. So, so what does that mean? Oftentimes, these patients that have both the, simple, the symptoms of mastocytosis are amplified. So those mast cell mediator type symptoms of mastocytosis in patients with HAT are, are more significant. The anaphylaxis is more severe. So, so we're actually at our center testing all of our systemic mastocytosis patients for HET, hereditary alpha tryptasemia. How do we do this? Again, this is relatively new. So unfortunately, we don't have billing codes for this yet. So it's really an out-of-pocket test. It's done, it's done by a lab, most commonly in Houston, Texas, gene by gene. And, and they'll run the test for you. It's an out-of-pocket uh, for the patient, but very, very important information about whether or not that patient may have hereditary alpha tryptasemia. It helps you know, potentially explain symptoms that they're having and may even help treatment as well. Next question is, is the pain associated with systemic mastocytosis? Is that pain chronic or does it occur as flares? So as you know, pain is a common symptom that these patients have with mastocytosis. And there, and there are different types of pain. The GI type pain is pretty episodic and it's, it's caused by the triggers that a patient with mastocytosis will be exposed to. Um, typically, this is more, again, fleeting type pains that can be treated pretty well with the, the mast cell medications. Other pains, such as bone pain that these patients may experience, that can be more chronic. And, and that's actually a little bit harder to treat. Um, even with our best mast cell mediator type medicines, antihistamines, chromalin, bone pain may still be an issue. So the answer to this is sort of yes, yes and no. Some pain is more episodic, may occur in a flare-like pattern, whereas other pain is more chronic, like the bone pain. Next question, what is the yield of that peripheral blood kit mutation? So getting that kit mutation from peripheral blood versus obtaining it from lesional tissue, say bone marrow tissue. Uh, so this has actually changed also in the recent uh, years, mainly because we have access to much higher sensitivity PCR tests that can detect that kit mutation. So this is the allele-specific oligo oligonucleotide QPR uh, test. This is also the, the digital droplet PCR test. Much higher sensitivities with this. So you can detect this mutation in one in 10,000 cells. Um, this is markedly increased from the traditional ways we were doing this with DNA sequencing. So studies have shown that, you know, again, you can detect this uh, mutation at a pretty high sensitivity with peripheral blood using, our, using these current methods. So really about and your indolent patients, you can detect this mutation in peripheral blood, the, the, the kit, uh, D816V mutation in about 85% of our indolent patients. So um, absolutely a test worth doing. Again, very sensitive with our current testing. Are foods that trigger SM, so systemic mesocytosis symptoms, the typical urticaria flaring uh, type foods, or is it the sort of IgE mediated type allergies? So you know, what, in, in Patients that with systemic mesocytosis that have food-related symptoms, you know, what, what's driving that? So I, you know, I think I tend to think of this in different ways. Patients with mesocytosis can have IgE-mediated allergy, and and you know, is this a predictable type of symptoms with a you know a predictable food like seafood, for instance? Do they get anaphylaxis? Let's, let's say so. And, uh, if that's the case, then you should investigate for an IgE-mediated food allergy. But patients with mastocytosis also get food-related symptoms due to, for, you know, for a lot of other reasons. They, they may get it, as you suggest here from the question, from the mast cell activation type symptoms themselves. So uh, really, there's, there's multiple reasons why patients with mastocytosis may have symptoms related to foods. It's not always IgE-mediated allergy. Oftentimes, it's related, actually more often related to the mast cell activation itself. Thank you very much for your time today. So I really hope you found this information helpful.
and thank you for joining.